Thank you. Before I, before I start, I just want to tell everybody I had about three beers, so lower your expectation. <laughs> On an empty stomach, it's always fun. Okay, why, why, why did uh, uh, Tanya ask me to speak these uh, uh, up here today? Um, I'm going to kind of just give you the end result and tell you why I did that. When we opened up in uh, 2000, we actually opened up the end of 2018, um, but really our first full year was 2019. Our first six months, we grossed $600,000. I'm sorry, I take that back. We grossed $200,000 over our first six months. Last year, we were able to bring that up to $2 million. So far this year, we are 40% ahead where we were last year. Um, so the question that should be going through everybody's head is kind of, how did we do that? And, and that's basically what she had asked me to come up here and start talking about. Um, we're only in less than 2,000 square feet. Um, and, 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 and that just to give you a little heads up on, on the type of place we have. So going back through my career, if, if if you had a failing restaurant, um, I've been in this industry, by the way, for 45 years. I know I look too young to do that, but it is 45 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you actually were, it, 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 and over my career, if you had a failing location, I was the person that you would hire to come in and help fix it. I was the person you would hire kind of like a, a, a good. John Tapper. Yeah, exactly, like a John Tapper or Gordon Ramsay. Um, hopefully I was a little bit more successful than they were at this. You know, fun fact about those, most of those places are even closed by the time they actually air the show, which is interesting in itself. But also, if you wanted to create a new restaurant or if you wanted to create a new menu or even a new product, again, I was the person that you would hire to do that. We've cre I've created, I've worked with thousands of operators over my life. I've also created dozens of concepts. Many for ourselves and many for other companies as well. The first location, the first concept I ever created was a concept called Dominic's of New York. And some of you from my Virginia might know that. Um, we were up from upstate New York down to southern uh, uh, Virginia. Um, and that was a food truck concept way before food trucks were a thing. Quite honestly, in the early 90s, if you had a food truck, people thought about it, well, you know, a food truck with food poisoning. It's not like you see today. Um, we signed a deal with Lowe's and we started opening up and we opened up 175 of them. Um, what we did, though, is we, we actually opened up and they, most of them were franchised because we wanted to open up quickly. And the nice thing about buying a franchise, and I know that some of you had actually purchased a franchise in, in the pour your own uh, 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 genre, uh, but nice thing about buying a franchise is that you can, uh, somebody else figured it all out for you. You know, they created the training manuals, they created the trade dress, they created the, 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 your, 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 your product line, they even got, figured out how to get the product to you. Um, the bad thing about creating a franchise is that you have to create all that for your operators so they can have the tools to succeed. And one of the things that I created um, to help them out was I created what I called my rules to live by to be successful. And these were very specific to the Dominics of New York franchise. You know, the rules that they, I wanted something that I could always point to for an, an operator and say, listen, are you doing all the things that are on your list, these top 10 things? And you know, so and you know, that's how I actually got them to be successful. Because I and, and most of them kind of little fun little quips, and I'll go into those in a minute. Um, but so you would think that I my wife and I retired in 2017, um, and we decided that you know, first of all, when you retire at 52 years old, just don't do that. Um, you spend the day drinking. Um, I, I, we, we bought a house on the beach, and I thought I was going to be fishing all day. Um, turns out I hate fishing. Um, the only thing that's nice about being on the beach all day long is you can drink, but the problem is, if you have a half a bottle of whiskey left at night and you don't have nowhere to go tomorrow, um, you finish the bottle of whiskey. <laughs> it's the way it is. So we decided that at 52 years old, we were gonna get back into the industry. Um, and at any given time, I have a whole bunch of ideas that are kind of floating around my head that I've seen other people do that I think would be successful. Kind of a good idea looking for a good location. Um, and one of the ideas that I had, I had seen a pour your own concept. It wasn't pour my beer at the time, but it was a pour your own. And I thought that this was something that I'd be interested in doing. Um, in St. Augustine, um, if you've ever been there, uh, there's a main street that goes down St. Augustine, it's called St. George Street. Um, and you know, the first thing you hear when you're opening up a restaurant is location, 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 of course. Um, St. George Street has six to seven million pedestrians a year outside of my door, right? You want that. You think that, hey, anything I do there is gonna succeed. So we decided that we wanted to open up a self-serve tap house here. Um, and it was, it, it, to me, it just, I, while I was looking for a location on St. George Street, I started um, looking at all the different self-serve uh, um, technology that was out there, and I had called them all. I landed on, I liked Pour My Beer, um, and then from Pour My Beer, I went to go visit a bunch of their locations. 
One of the locations I visited was Tapster's, and I'm sure many of you have visited that location as well. Um, and quite honestly, he ruined my life for a couple of years, and I'll tell you why. I walked in there, and it, it, it's the holy grail of, 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 the, of the industry that we're in. He had two employees working, probably grossing somewhere between thirty dollars and $40,000 a week. I, that's all I could see. You know, that's, I'm in this industry my whole life. I've never actually seen anything like that. It was absolutely what I wanted. I act, talked to him for probably two or three hours. He probably hated me. Um, but I asked him a thousand questions. I asked him, why, you know, why no food? His response was F, not F, but the word. He was like, F food. I'm like, all right, that's going to be my new mantra. No food. Food's what I do, but I'm going to have no food because I want that. Now, in my rules, over the years, as I started creating my own personal rules, and I started my sphere of knowledge in the restaurant industry grew, and I started creating other concepts, so did my rules. They became more generic towards any type of restaurant business. And it, 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 I, to date, anybody I've ever worked with, I actually will sit there and tell them to, you know, I'll sit there and we'll go over the rules with them. And there are a lot of different rules, and they hate it. When I tell you they hate it, because I'm, you know, generally if I'm working with somebody, they, they're in a failing business. And they, when, I, when I go over the rules with them, it's kind of like shining a light on all the things they're doing wrong. And they hate it. They hate the process. Absolutely hate the process. For example, we'll have a rule in there. I have a rule, one rule that says keep your mind on your money. And that talks about food costs and talks about how to calculate food costs and how to help with food costs and labor costs and all different things concerning money. But one of the questions I'll ask them is how much money is in your bank account? And I'm going to tell you, inevitably, if they're in a failing business, they have no idea. And they have no idea because they don't want to know. And I get that. You know, we've, all, we've all had businesses that just aren't, weren't doing so well. Um, but at this point, I'm retiring. And I have my rules. I've done them all my life. And I'm going to retire. And I'm going to do real well. I'm going to open up this thing on St. George Street. And we're going to make a, a whole bunch of money. As I mentioned, I really didn't look at my rules because I think they're in my head. And I'm too confident in myself. And we grossed $200,000 over the first uh, six months. Um, our rent is $12,000 a month. We weren't even making rent. It was absolutely awful. Um, I say six months, but the truth is, by the middle of month three, I already knew this was failing. You know, I'm already creating solutions for this at that point. And I did just what I tell my operators to do. I took out my rules, I kind of blew the dust off of them, and I started reading through them. And, and, and I understood exactly how my operators felt over the years, because it told me everything I was doing wrong. The first thing that actually became real, real clear to me is I have a rule that's don't let your dream cloud your judgment. And what that means is at the beginning of it, it actually talks about picking the right location. Because a lot of people will think that, oh, I can't find that perfect location, but my concept is so great, it's going to make money no matter where I put it. And I'm telling you right now, from my experience, that doesn't work that way. If you pick a bad location, it's going to be that much harder to grow your business. And you have no room for error at the beginning. Because if you tick off a customer and you don't have a lot of traffic in front of you, you're not going to get them back. So I, I, when I started clicking off my rules, don't let your dreams cloud your judgment, here's the, the initial mistake that I made in August. Um, when you go into, I, I mistakenly thought of, of, of St. Augustine as a vacation town. Um, it's not. It's a tourist town. And there's a fundamental difference that you have to be aware of when you're opening up in places like that. When you are going on vacation and you want to stay in a place for a week, generally you make reservations all week. Um, and, and you, that's what you're going to, you know, you know where you're going to eat. When you're making a day trip to a tourist town, like from places like Jacksonville or, or Daytona or even Tampa to go to St. Augustine, you don't even plan where you're going to eat. You just say, you know what, I'll figure it out when I get there. It's not abnormal to have a three or four hour wait to get into a restaurant on St. George Street. Um, that's one fundamental difference. The other fundamental difference is a vacationer, they power drink. They get to where they're going, and they'll sit there for four or five hours, and we all do it. You just sit there, you let, let the wives go shopping, and we just sit there, and we're going to power drink all day long, watch the game, whatever's going on. So that's what you do when you're a day tripper. Yeah, maybe you'll have one or two beers, but you're not going to sit there and drink all day. Now, my problem was because Roman, I do, do all know Roman? Um, Roman from Taps just told me, F food, I was on that, <laughs> I was on that, um, but that didn't work for us. And I realized at that point that we need to make some serious changes to our business. And this is probably March. Um, it, it, it was going to take me a few months to actually make all the changes I wanted. And one thing that always comes to my mind is, is stop trying to sell the customer what you want to sell them. You need to sell them what they want to buy. Um, and we all lose that at times. We're all so fixated on what we have, and this is what they're going to have. This is what we're going to sell them. We're going to make them want it. You've got to sell them what they want. And if you walk outside of my place, now if you walk into Tapsters, 
it's a bunch of beer snobs that look like this young lady in the back who will only drink beer out of a glass and wants 27 different types of sours. If you walk outside of my place in Augie's, it's Bubba. And he's from the Midwest with his family on vacation. Um, that's the people that are outside. They don't want to buy a sour for, for $15. They want Bud Light. Our number one selling beer by far is Bud Light, by far. And then our second, third, fourth, and fifth are all um, ciders because Bubba's wife likes to drink sours. She doesn't want a beer, it tastes terrible. She wants something sweet. That's my customer, and I had to recognize that. I also loaded with all that information knowing that I had families that are out there, mostly families. We decided to sell food. Um, we were selling food at the beginning, don't get me wrong. We, we were selling, um, uh, you know, but it made up 10% of our menu. It was just snacks, pretzels, you know, things like that, mozzarella sticks, things like that, french fries. Um, but we decided that we were gonna sell food. And that's where kind of, like I said, I blew the dust off of my, 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 uh, my rules and I said, all right, what's going to work here? What's Bubba gonna want? I realized at that moment that because it's a three to four hour wait to get a, a reservation on St. Augustine, uh, on St. George Street, we needed quick service restaurants. There was only two. There was a pizzeria and there was a taco shop. We were gonna become the third. Um, we just landed on doing uh, a hamburgers. I wanted to become a burgers and brews type of place. And as I would tell everybody, don't be creative if you don't have to be. Early in my career, I was so creative in the foods that I was creating. I was so creative in the concepts I was creating. Inevitably, somebody with a lot more money would copy me and then I'd end up competing with my own concept. As time went on and I got a little smarter, I started copying other people. So I went out there and said, who's doing a good burger? I love Five Guys Burger. I love their concept. I love the way that you can order it. I love everything about it. I just copied them. If you go in my place and you look at my menu and you look deep at it, because mind you, I put a lot of my own personality into it and I also put a lot of local flair into it, but it's a Five Guys menu. I use the same meat exact same meat that they use. We had the same process, we cook it the same way, we do everything the same way they did because they were a quick serve, they're a quick service restaurant that can get product out there and charge a lot of money for it too, by the way. Um, so we decided that that's the direction we were gonna go. We started at July 1st in 2019 um, and between July and December, uh, the end of December, we grossed another 400,000, doubled our sales. Um, and, it, it, but, you know, and that came with a lot of problems, although I knew I had the right product, so that's when it actually started going into how do we get this to make more money? Um, 400,000 was nice, so we, we roll into 2020, and let's not talk about 2020 because we all know that was a dumpster fire. Uh, just, so let, let, let's just pass through that year, um, but, you know, later on in the year. But what I realized is then it, it brings me to how do I start making this concept that I found the right concept that works on St. George Street for the people that are out there, and I needed to start making more money. Because again, I'm paying $12,000 a month rent, $400,000 over, maybe that's $800,000 a year, it's still not enough. Um, so we, as we went along, I started, you know, our rule number two, is it rule number two? My rule number two is actually called uh, 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 focus on the rush. And what do I mean by that? Focus on the rush is I get on Saturdays and, and, and uh, Fridays and Saturdays, we had lines out the door. Um, at the time, at the beginning, we only had one cash register. We only had a two foot grill because I didn't expect it to be that busy. But all my efforts, all of my efforts were how do I get these lines through, the, through it quicker? And before I get that, let me actually back up a second. A lot of people, when they have a restaurant and you're busy on Friday night, you're busy on Saturday night, maybe you're busy on Sunday because you have sports or, or, or you're near a church, and everybody will say, all right, we're doing really well on the weekends. We just need to focus, put our focus on the weekdays. We need to do Taco Tuesday, or we need to do, I, I, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Karaoke Thursday. Um, and that's what people look and they put their time, their money, and their, and their focus on those days. I'm telling you right now, in my experience, in 45 years, the opposite approach is a better approach. You know, if you take that, you know, uh, during the week, why do you make less money? It's because there's less people out there buying food. There's less people going out. There's less people buying beer. They're just not going out during the week. So you are competing with other restaurants to fight over the scraps of people that are out there. My suggestion to everybody, instead of doing that, Focus on your busy nights and make your busy nights incredibly busy. Rule, everybody likes to drink in a crowded bar. We all know that, we all get more exciting. We hate waiting for our lines, well we don't have lines, but we hate waiting, but we like to be in a crowded bar. It has energy, it makes you feel good. Make your busy days busier. Don't do a tap takeover on Tuesday, do a tap takeover on Saturday when you're busy, when you think you don't need it. Max out your place to the point where you can't get people in it, where they're just dying to get in there. 
Because what happens is, without even trying, the rest of the week comes up. You know the saying that, that a rising tides raise all ships? That's absolutely right. I do no marketing between uh, Mondays and Thursday. I don't do any type of marketing whatsoever. All of a sudden, three years ago, when we were doing $500 on a Tuesday, we're now doing four to $6,000 on a Tuesday. And we do nothing for it, except that we're getting people that are coming back to us. We've got, all of our focus is put on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If, if, if you can't have a happy hour on a Saturday, sounds ridiculous, but it actually will work. It makes people excited. When you do happy hour during the week, what I've noticed is people come in, they stay for happy hour, and they leave. You do happy hour on a Saturday for just an hour, maybe two hours, people stay after that, and they start paying full price. At least that's what I've noticed. And it seems to be true, everything that we've done throughout my life. So we needed to focus on the rush. We need to focus on Saturdays and Sundays, oh, well, not Sundays yet, uh, Fridays and Saturdays. And we got it to the point, we, had, we started with one cash register, now we're up to, we have three actually registers in there and two handhelds. When it's busy, we're working five registers at one time. Um, it, it's just, it, it seems to just work much better. Um, Second part that we actually started, after now that we have everything, I feel comfortable. We have, we have good throughput. We got the people coming into our place. We're making money. Now it's time to actually start doing marketing because I didn't want to do any type of marketing before we actually figured out who we were going to be. Um, and my marketing, I don't have time to sit here and tell you all the different types of marketing or all the different things that I did, but I'm going to just give you kind of the highlights that, that, that we did. Um, first thing that you also know is my rule number seven is it starts today. And what do I mean by that? Years ago, we did a survey at all of our Dominics of New York locations across many states, from Pennsylvania on down to Virginia. And we surveyed well over 1,000 people. And we had what I consider a throwaway question just to get people kind of used, uh, uh, used to the questions and answers. And we asked them, have you ever been here before? Simple question. That answer to that question has changed the way I always look at building a business. 10% of the people that came over there said they'd never been to my place before. Think about that. If every week 10% of your customers are brand new, no matter how god-awful you are right now, you could change your stars tomorrow because 10% of those people never saw you before. 10% of those people don't know how bad it was yesterday. They only know that you're giving them, you're wowing them today. And what could happen when you wow somebody immediately? They're gonna start bringing people back. And then you're gonna start getting that rule of one person telling another person, telling another person. And I, I just wanna explain that to you to get it in your head the way somebody had explained it to me once before. They said, they, they said if you had a piece of paper the size of the, 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 the not the universe, the solar system, and you fold it in half, it goes from 0.01 millimeter to 0.02 millimeters. And then of course to 0.04 and so on. How many times can I fold this piece of paper to hit the moon? It's actually 42, who said 42? There you go. <laughs> only 42 times. It's not a million. It's not a t you, only 42 times. So although your marketing may be slow at the beginning, if you keep up with it and people are telling other people, word of mouth marketing is absolutely the best type of marketing that you could ever do. It takes longer to make it happen, but you know, when you're on your 41st fold, you're halfway to the moon, but the 42nd fold gets you to the moon. By the way, your 43rd fold gets you to the moon and back. That's how word of mouth marketing works. There was a great book years ago uh, by Malcolm uh, Gladwell um, called The Turning Point. If none of you have ever read that, you really need to. He actually talks about uh, um, something going viral way before there was an internet. Um, but he was talking about word of mouth, just humans talking to each other and how things can go viral. Um, he didn't really give you a way to make things go viral, but he looked at case studies of things that went viral and told you how it happened. Um, but it, 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 it talks mostly about word of mouth. And throughout my career, that's always been the biggest marketing tool I've ever used. And today, because of social media, it's a little different. You know, things going viral, that's what people think about social media. Um, so you have really two types of, uh, of, of, so, uh, of things going viral, or word of mouth marketing. Um, one is old school. Again, that's when you, one human talks to another. And the other is, is, is um, on social media, where people can actually start talking to you, talking about it. And I'd actually venture to say that people have a much louder voice today than they had years ago. But we took two approaches at Augie's. The first one was the old school. When we decided to go with a burger menu, um, I'm paying vacation, I'm paying uh, tourist town rents. I pay $12,000 a month rent. Um, the, I, so that means I started charging vacation prices. So we charge for a burger, we charge 15 to $25 for a burger. It's not cheap, but again, we're paying high rent. 
all the people that work down there, all the industry workers that are down there, they all are getting paid minimum wage, maybe minimum plus a few dollars, but they're all not making a lot of money and they really can't afford to pay vacation prices or, or tourist prices in there. So I immediately so, uh, started charging all of them half price on all of our food. So instead of spending $15 for a burger, they're spending $7.50. You know, instead of spending $3 for a soda, they're spending $1.50. Well, that went through the entire industry like uh, down there like, like wildfire. We started getting customers all, all across the board, all of them were starting to come to us. Not only did they, are they coming to us, but they really like us. Like it's the type of goodwill that I could never ever imagine buying anywhere. All of a sudden you start talking to our customers and, and mind you, I give away probably the half off is about $200 a day. It's not as much as you might think. But what that bought me is if you sit there and you start talking to customers, they're going to be the old man at the cigar shop told me to come over. Or the woman taking care of, the maid taking care of our room told me to come over. Or the trolley driver was saying, when you get off here, make sure you go to Augie's. Um, that's the kind of goodwill it bought us. And it was, it's at, I mean, I'm telling you, if you went to our place right now and polled them, almost all of them will say somehow, some way they would talk to come over. The second way that actually, and, and I skipped over one before I get into new school, I wanted to say one thing because we have the sign up here. Um, years ago, when I opened up my first location, it was called Dominic's of New York. It was a, a food truck, well, it was actually a trailer. It was parked in front of Lowe's Home Centers in Richmond, Virginia. And my father um, was, was very sick at the time. Um, he was in the final stages of ALS. So I took a bunch of pictures of it and I brought it up to him. Now he could barely even speak. And I showed it to my father and he said, are your sales not what you thought they would be? And I said, no, no, dad, they're not, but we're doing this and we're doing that. We're gonna get them there. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. First day was good, but we'll get, you know, it's just a matter of time. And he said, he looked at me and he just said, you're not telling the customers what you're selling. <clears throat> and it, it just like smacked me right in the face at that point, because it said Dominic's of New York on it, but it told nobody what I was selling out of it. So as soon as I got back, I started putting steak sandwiches, sausage sandwiches, things that we sold, and sure enough, sales went up. Fast forward to opening up Augie's and three months into it and I'm kind of failing and I'm looking up at the sign and all the sign was was just Augie's draft room. Now what makes my place special? It's just a place that sells beer. There's a thousand places that sell beer on St. George Street. I immediately put self-serve tap house on there and my sales went right up. Because the self-serve tap house, this isn't special. This is special. It's why we're all here because self-serve tap house is what makes us special. And of course then when we started selling burgers, of course I put burgers on there. Um, and, and that really helped out more than you know right at the beginning. That kind of got us into that $400,000 range the second half of the year. So going back to marketing, um, the new school marketing, which is social media, which I'm, might be one of the oldest people in here, so you would think that I know nothing about social media, and you would be right. I mean, I, I, I know I have an Instagram. Don't ask me how to get to it. I have one, I know I do, because I get messages that say, but I click on it and I don't know the passwords. I have no idea how to get there. But my kids say that I possess something that's very good for social media. They say that I'm extra. Now, extra is millennial speech for that I do things over the top. And they are absolutely right. I am 100% extra. You go, go to the first one, just so I know which ones I'm talking about. I wanna make sure I'm in, oh, I have the right order here while you figure that out. So when I had, when I, for the various restaurants I created over the years and some of the bigger concepts, we would do sponsorships. We do sponsorships like for the Washington Nationals. Um, we were the official hot dog of the Washington Nationals for the first four years. And because of that, I got them all to sign a jersey, the, the inaugural team, they signed a jersey and I framed it and I put it in my office. I had the first ticket for the, the Washington Nationals, I framed it and put it in my office. We did a sponsorship with the Islanders, that Mike Bossy signed a ticket for me. Over there, and then because of that, my staff started buying me sports memorabilia for Christmas and, and, and my my birthday, because it was easy. They didn't have to think about it. They were able to get me that. So when we opened up Augie's, we had, we had a bunch of TVs, and I said, you know what? I'm just gonna hang them up on the wall. I had about 60 pieces of, uh, of memorabilia. And people started taking pictures of it and, and posting it, because they liked it. You know, there were cool things that were on the wall. When the pandemic hit, I mean, I'm realizing this, and we're making the changes to our business. I actually just found this fun game to go on all of the various uh, uh, auction websites and start bidding on sports memorabilia. And sometimes I get crazy, like I have a picture of Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio and it cost me 120 bucks, signed autographs by them. Used to, we started putting them, right now by the way, we have over 600 pieces of sports memorabilia hanging on my walls. When you walk into our front corridor, oh wait, I don't have that picture in here. Okay, oh it's the next one, okay, we'll get to that in a second. So you'll see, it's the next one, yeah, just hold that. So these are all the pictures that are in there, so when you walk into the front door of our place, go to the next picture. 
on the walls on either side, going to our cash registers, um, there's this autographed picture of every Super Bowl winning quarterback. And I'm going to tell you more people take pictures with, these, with, with their favorite quarterback than you could imagine. And they're posting them online. It's just when you tell them, and the funny thing is I'll sit there and I'll say, yes, I have a picture of every quarterback in the, in the NFL, you know, every quarterback that won the Super Bowl. And of course they quiz you. Do you have Joe Namath? Well, yeah, I have Joe Namath. I said every quarterback. You know, do you have Joe Montana? What didn't you hear me when I said I have every quarterback? Um, they take pictures of them. They absolutely love doing it. It works out well. And, and it, it's something that I love. I have about $10,000 worth of stuff on there. People ask me how much it all costs you. It's probably not as much as they think, but I tell them it costs me enough money that I can never complain how much my wife spends. And that's fine because it works. People love that. I'm also a little humorous when it comes into the, give the next one. I hang signs up that get people to take pictures of them. Of course, I put my logo on every single sign that we have up. Now, you're laughing. You're probably laughing at this one here. Not only is this the most photographed sign that we have in our place, that is the fourth one because people steal them. They love stealing them, but our name is on all of them. <laughs> and pe people, pe people take pictures of them. You know, a a as Tanya was telling you early on, you just want something they're gonna take a picture of. You just want something that they're going to put out there on social media, and this does it. Just be a little humorous, but make sure you get your logo on there so that people are doing it. Uh, the last thing that I did, and probably the most overtop thing that I did, and I didn't know it at the time because it just seemed like it was gonna be fun and a cool thing to do, is I don't know if any of you have been to St. Augustine, but in St. Augustine from right before, th right before uh, Christmas, I'm sorry, right before Thanksgiving till the end of January, they have something that they call Nights of Lights. And what Nights of Lights is, is, is just the entire town, is just the city pays for it. It's completely lit up. And all the businesses kind of got hold of that, and they all started lighting up their place, too. Um, and quite, if you read any kind of uh, travel magazine going into St. August, uh, go, uh, about the South, they'll say that it's the, the best place to go to see lights in all of the South. So, of course, me being extra, I'm going to get on top of that well as well. If you go into my place um, during, during Nights of Lights, it looks like Christmas threw up in there. I mean, it's, I, I, we hang balls from the ceiling, but I mean, they're, the side, they're like this. Just entire ceilings just loaded with them. Um, it's, what, you know, it's what I do, but that's not really gonna bring people in your place. Once they're in there, it makes them feel good because they're in the Christmas spirit. That's not the part that actually worked out the best. I decided to spend $125, that's right, just $125, and I bought a snow machine. And every night at seven o'clock for seven minutes, this is what Augie's looks like. Every night. 125 bucks it cost me. When I tell you that people get there at five o'clock, they start drinking and eating with their families, and they stay there till the snow. It adds $2,000 a day, $125 snow machine. It adds $2,000 a day to my sales. It's unbelievable. In July, I'll be walking around Walmart and I'm wearing my shirt and somebody inevitably will ask me, you doing the snow this year? It is without question the best thing I've ever done. It put us on the map. In fact, I didn't even take this picture. It was done by some photographer that posted it somewhere. Um, without questions, $125 machine. When you think about that, my beer wall cost me $125,000. This brings me more business than my beer wall. <laughs> There's a lot of people in here, and let, let's face it. We're all entrepreneurs. We're all egomaniacs, and we all want to tell our story. All of us. And everybody in here will tell you their story and find out what makes their business special because that might be the one thing that furthers your business. Now, I've told you everything that I want to say. Does anybody have any questions? Well, good. That's easy enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.